Um, yeah, so what have you been up to? How's, how's, how's Seattle? How's, how's your new lab? Uh, my, my new lab is great. I work with um, their fish systematists. So first and foremost, what they do is describe species of fish and construct phylogenies of fish. So they're really fish experts. Mm -hmm. And um, I wouldn't, I, I, my background is in fish biology, but I think more about like diversification and phylogenetics like in general. And so um, it's been interesting to see how this lab is different than John's lab, where John's lab, we think about like question first and then find a system. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for, for my students who watch this, John Weens is a very hard guy to, to keep on top of his publications, uh, of, but he, he does a lot of big papers on like big questions of why are there so many species, you know, kind of using molecular phylogenetics and um, other tools. Is that kind of fair? But he's like a good herper too. He's like a solid organismal guy, but also like a very questiony person. Right. I was I was looking at your CV and I I didn't realize. So you were you worked with Resnick when you were an undergrad, or was that? Yeah. So that's cool. was that in like the Trinidadian guppy system? That's so, so I cool. grew up in uh, that part of I grew up in Riverside, California. And when I was a senior in high school, my teacher knew Dr. Resnick. Oh, that was when you were in high school. I had just graduated high school, and oh, that's so cool. My teacher introduced me to Dr. Resnick, and he hired me that summer to clean aquariums. And um, he actually paid me, which is uh, was awesome. I didn't realize at the time how rare that was. And that's that was great, though. But that's like he does such cool science, so it's really cool to I don't know have even just cleaned aquaria for for someone like that. Like that, I would clean his aquariums. Like that's cool. I know, and I I had no understanding at the time of just how famous he was. Um, so eventually, I worked up to like actually collecting data. Like he let me take out calipers and measure fish and stuff, and nice. I just thought it was so fun. And it was like my very first research experience. It, I wasn't actually like you know I didn't have my own project or anything but it I was working in a lab and it made me realize like that was what a research career might look like cool that's so cool it's so funny he actually reviewed a paper that I was going to tell you about today and oh, I yeah. just reviews for this paper back last week oh my gosh so it's fresh it's fresh it's emotionally well, fresh yeah it was a rejection which is a little painful but oh um, of the three reviewers, David Resnick was the only one that like identified himself as such, and he actually gave probably the best review of the three because it was very balanced. And I sent him an email afterwards just to thank him for it, and um, like he remembers who I am and stuff, which is cool. That's so awesome. Yeah. That's really really cool. Yeah. So do you want to do you want to talk about the paper a little bit? Sure. So we test the hypothesis the long-standing hypothesis that sexual dichromatism, which is like color differences between males and females, mm -hmm. influences speciation rates. And this is a hypothesis that links back all the way to Darwin. Um, in one of his books, he comes up with the idea that um, sexually selected traits may have something to do with species richness of groups. And so I spent the last two years of my PhD combing the literature for the presence or absence of sexual dichromatism across fishes. And it was super fun because I got to go to the library. Like I, I went to the library and just grabbed every book I could carry on like fishes and combed through these old books. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and I, I got so obsessed with it, I actually managed to find data for like all the fish families. Um, so then we, we use, uh, diversification rate methods using phylogenies to, mm -hmm. to see if sexually dichromatic fishes have faster diversification rates than monochromatic fishes. And the answer we find is really complicated. Um, if you analyze all fishes at once, like the whole entire phylogeny of fishes, you get no difference. But if you, huh. if you break the phylogeny up into smaller groups, like if you only analyze families, mm -hmm. um, then a few families do show a difference. Oh, cool. Um, and then if you go up to orders within families, then you start to lose the difference. So like, 
the, the take home message of that paper was to see an effect of sexual dichromatism on diversification, you had to look at fine taxonomic scales and the deeper in time you go and the broader the comparison, like that difference disappears. Yeah, did, did you see that paper that Catherine Graham had about like phylogenetic scale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so like you, the, the phylogenetic scale that you're asking your question at changes the answer sometimes. That's a really tricky, tricky one. So, so basically some fish, uh, I guess above the order level, they're, they're just more prone to speciation for other reasons, or th they had some other kind of key innovation that swaps out the dichromatism data. Is that, is that kind of what's going on? Exactly, yeah. Cool. Sucks that I got rich. <laughs> Sorry, it, was it just like kind of not up? What, did you try to submit to like a really high profile journal and it, they just said it wasn't quite significant enough or? Well, so this, we sent it to Nature first, then Science, then it, so it was rejected from six journals. What? Wow, jeez, yeah. Started from Nature all the way down. It finally got sent out to review. It got rejected for five, the first five journals just without review, just on kind of desk rejection, yeah. Yeah, so they finally sent it out for review in PLOS Biology and I was so excited. And then that was like a month and a half ago and oh, we just no. got the feedback and it's like a hard reject. So now we've got to find uh, the next thing. Oh, geez. That's such a, I mean, is there anything, it's, it's just like, this isn't exciting. Is, is that essentially the critique? Like, are, are they critiquing your methods at all? Or was it just more, they didn't think it was an interesting result? Uh, a little of both. So, um, this wasn't David Resnick, but we had a reviewer two situation where the review two just hated it and went on and on about how the methods were wrong and this and that. Huh. And I don't agree. I don't agree with reviewer two. Um, yeah. I think reviewer two was misinformed, but um, reviewer three said this is a this is a good paper. There's nothing wrong with it. The only thing I can say that's wrong with it is that it's not novel because we're using SSC models and I've reviewed so many papers that use SSC models and there's nothing that they're doing that's any different from any of those papers. And Yeah. Mm. And that's a hard one to address because like if, if they don't think your paper's novel, then there's nothing like that's sort of like a full stop. Like you can't convince them otherwise. Mm. That's annoying. Um, yeah, that's, it's just the reality of science is that there's this kind of like the file drawer effect. If, if people don't think your results are kind of like splashy enough, they, they won't publish them in certain journals anyway. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's a home for this paper somewhere, but like it's too bad that if it's methodologically sound, like I, I guess I don't, I don't totally understand the objection to, can you talk maybe a little bit more about SSE models and why that's, I, I don't understand why that would be, a, it's just not novel enough. Um, so the reviewer too is the one who is talking about our SSC model approach being wrong. And and this might be more technical than your class. No, get, in, get into it, get into the weeds. Okay, yeah. so um, SSC stands for State Speciation and Extinction Model. And so they were designed to tease out effects of a state you're interested in, like sexual dichromatism on speciation and extinction rates. And the first iteration of this model, you would, what you would do is you would fit a model where um, there was no difference in speciation or extinction anywhere on your phylogeny. And you would compare the fit of that model to one where, um, yes, the trait you're interested in has an increase of, in speciation or decrease in speciation. Mm -hmm. And so the problem in that is it's also very possible that you do have variation in speciation and extinction rates on your phylogeny, but it, it's not related to the trait. It's related to some other trait that you're not looking at. And so then they develop this sort of second wave of models where they will allow you to have your cake and eat it too, where you can break up the rate variation into finer categories and only some of those categories might be related to the trait and other categories are related to some other thing and so that's a more flexible approach because you can fit a bunch of models where yes dichromatism influences speciation but there's also this other thing 
that influences speciation. Um, and that's the approach that we use in this paper is this more flexible approach. Mm -hmm. But their view was, I think they were confused because they were saying, oh, you're basically saying that um, if anything influences speciation, it's always going to wipe out the effect of sexual dichromatism because the model will track anything changing speciation. But it's mm. more flexible than that because it can, you can fit a model where diversification increases speciation and another thing increases speciation. Like that's an option in this framework um, that I don't think they knew about or, or whatever. Yeah, oh, that's, that's a bummer. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, so, so I guess just kind of bro going back to like the broader picture though, the, the cool thing about SSE models, you know, sort of from a more kind of big picture standpoint is that it's, it, it allows you to address the question of why some lineages are more diverse than others. You know, you, you go through and you look for, um, you know, either morphological traits or, um, you know, biogeography or, you know, some, some sort of trait. Uh, I'm just not, not explaining this to you, but to, to the other humans. Um, but, uh, so it's it's a cool kind of in, in general I, th I think it's a really interesting um, set of questions to ask on a big phylogeny like that and I I guess it's you know I think it's confusing that um, yeah it's it's surprising and confusing that they didn't think that this was interesting because I feel like I mean the the just general like is sexual dimorphism predictive of um, diversification. That's that's a really broadly interesting question that a lot you know people who work on a lot of different animals are interested in. I, I think I've I, I know like the the damselfly people have have looked at that, and um, I feel like I've seen other other papers looking at questions like that too. So it seems like you want to test it for like the largest group of vertebrates. I don't know. Yeah, that's what we thought too. That's what we thought was exciting <laughs> about it, but. Um... What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't want to like take up too much of your afternoon, but do you have, do you have time to get into like what, what's kind of next, like what you're going to start on next or what you've already started on at your new sure. home? Yeah. So um, I have an NSF postdoctoral fellowship. So that, that means I had to write a grant proposal a year ago. So I, I applied for the postdoc I have now in November, 2018. I was notified that I got it April 2019, mm -hmm. and then they let, they're let they flexible about when you start, so I postponed my start date until January of this year because I wanted to finish my PhD and do all that. Yeah. So this has been like- And you like got married too, right? Like that yeah, was- <laughs> and, uh, Yeah, yeah. So congratulations, I, I haven't like seen you in real life since since all of that has happened. So congratulations on all of that, by the way. <laughs> like, well, thank you. Dr. Liz uh, and yeah, getting married and everything. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's probably worth mentioning to your students. Like I, I planned a wedding, got married and I took a honeymoon that was like a week long where I didn't do any work. So it's important to take vacations. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely taken a week off from work without being on a honeymoon too. So yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, yeah. De definitely take vacations. Yeah. I, I think the, for some of our undergrads, the, the sort of grad student mentality maybe hasn't set in yet, but yeah, for, for early grad students, I think that's, that's super duper important to hear. Yeah. So sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but, but you're, you're starting out on your new NSF funded postdoc adventure. Right, and so it, it's a project that's been now like, I guess, a, I don't know, over a year in the making because I had to like come up with the idea to write the thing. And then, mm -hmm. Anyway, so the, the project itself is on shallow versus deep sea uh, habitats. And so the framework that my marine terrestrial paper was on, we're now applying it to the shallow deep transition. Oh, cool. Um, so something like 80% of fishes live in shallow habitats like coral reefs and 20% mm -hmm. live in the deep sea. And that 20% is actually probably larger than a lot of people realize. There's actually quite a lot of species diversity in the deep sea, mm. um, but certainly not to the extent of shallow habitats. And so the, the project is why, why is that? 
And part of the answer may have to do with diversification rates. Part of it may have to do with the fact that it's really hard to transition from shallow to deep habitats because deep habitats are just crazy habitats because they're high pressure and there's darkness and there's all these reasons why it, it would be really hard to live in the deep sea. Yeah. And so in addition to the normal phylogenetic approach that I've been doing, what I'm extending to this is um, morphological change. And the, I picked the school that, in the lab that I picked because they're involved in CT scanning uh, museum specimens. Right, all right, yeah. And so what you get if you do that is um, you get a 3D scan of the skeleton and internal image, uh, any internal structures that you want, you can get a 3D image of it. And so we're going to test hypotheses related to like, um, do deep sea fishes evolve new body shapes? Or alternatively, is there like a particular body shape that is good for being in the deep sea? And so you have to have that body shape first before you enter the deep sea, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So the best example I can give you is like an anglerfish. The anglerfish is the really round blobby thing and it's got the, you know, the lure. Wow. So they have shallow ancestors that look like that too, and they're called frog fishes. And oh, I never put that together. That that I do kind of know what frog fishes look like, and they do kind of look like ugly, flat angler fishes or whatever. Yeah, yeah. They, um, they're super weird looking. They live on coral reefs. Mm -hmm. They've also got that, and they've also been yeah. around. And so maybe being round is a feature that lets you make death transitions more easily hmm. than looking like a regular fish. Gotcha. And so we're going to look at the timing of change in body shape and, and all that. Are there, are there examples of body shapes that just like obviously don't work at depth? Does that make sense? Yeah. I guess like a seahorse or something, but like that's obviously like a super weird example, but um because i feel like there's a lot of shape diversity in, in deep fishes too right so it's i, don't I know. think there is um in general deep sea fishes are like either long and skinny mm. or like round and blobby and yeah. there are some things that aren't either of those so like lantern fishes look like a regular fish like they're sort of like elongate and rounded mm -hmm. um and they're called lanternfish because they've got bioluminescence and all that. But um, what's different about them is they're really blobby. Mm -hmm. But the shape maybe isn't that different from a normal fish. Yeah, gotcha. Hmm. That's really cool. I love those, like, the CT scans. I, I mean, just the, out, the output of CT scans are always so cool to look at, too, because you get, like, the, the 3D models of everything you can play with. And um, I don't know. I think that's really... We've, we've tried to get some of that stuff going for land snails but um, we just don't have access to a scanner for free so it's uh yeah it's kind of an impediment because um yeah we, we just can't like pay for enough time to get all our species done but um that's definitely something that we've looked into we we did i i was on a paper where we described some land snails from amber from cretaceous amber and we got the the micro ct scans for those were really important because obviously like Amber's much less dense than calcium carbonate, so you can see the shells really well, and that was really cool. But yeah, fish skeletons are just like, they're so, yeah, there's so much stuff going on. That's really cool. I know. Um, well, I wonder if, like, Friday Harbor, I went there recently for a workshop, and they had uh, entomologists there scanning stuff, so. Cool. Yeah, I know. So we we worked with the AMNH because um, that's the like Mr. Amber fossil guy. David Grimaldi is is there, um, and so they do have access to a, a a CT scanner that they can they can just use. And so he was able to get our specimens done for free. But you know he and he, he was co-author on our paper, which was totally fine. But um, just the volume that we would want, you know what I mean? Like to to actually get in the queue for that micro CT scanner, it, you just have to wait like a really long time to to get enough scope time to to do your, you know, like a hundred species or something. So mm -hmm. I don't know. We're still we're still thinking about it. There's there's a guy in um in Okinawa who's doing a lot of a ton of ant stuff too. Um 
and that was that was part of his startup was like getting a micro CT scanner and he became like Mr. Ant micro CT kind of kind of thing. So um, it is it's like a cool new technology that people are um, they're kind of throwing like classic problems at right like it's it's a lot of these morphological questions you can ask in just a more quantitative way if you have micro CT data or CT scan data. Mm -hmm. Um, cool, dude. Well, I, I, I guess, I mean, this is, this is just a really loose form kind of, you know, here's, here's Liz Miller, here's what she does, um, kind of a situation. Uh, and it's been more than 15 minutes, so I, I don't mean to keep you, but, um, yeah, thank, thanks so much for making the time to do this. And it was, it was nice, like, just catching up with you real quick. Um, yeah. Um, I, yeah. How are you doing? I didn't ask enough, like, how your stuff is going. Oh, let me, <laughs> let me, let me hit stop on the recording button. <laughs>